I want to share four points from the text of Isaiah 62 about four major things that I, I see there that we should be thinking about and praying for. Four, four points from the text, and they come in a certain order, and the order is important. The first one is about the salvation and righteousness of Israel. The second one is about the peace and prosperity of Israel and Jerusalem. The third one about the unity and the one new man. And the fourth one is about the marriage. I was very, what our brother did here with, I don't know if that was, a, I think it was a marriage thing. It looked kind of bridal at the beginning place in that. I said, ah, very nice, because that's where the message fin finishes. Because in Isaiah 62, there's some pretty interesting verses about God marrying this land and this city. Did you see that in Isaiah 62? What does that mean? We'll talk about it. Father, thank you for this time. We just ask for your blessing, Lord, on the word, blessing on these verses from the prophet Isaiah. B'shem Yeshua. Amen. Verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet. By the way, I'm not going to talk about this a lot today, but it's really interesting in Isaiah to figure out who is who. When it says I here, who is that? Is that God? Is that Isaiah? Both? Something to think about. Until her righteousness goes forth like brightness, and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. I've been watching the, uh, a lot of people pray and different things that are being sent around the internet and WhatsApp groups and all kinds of things. We were just, uh, Jeremiah and I, the guy was leading worship, we were just in the United States for eight days, came back last two nights ago. Uh, visited a lot of different places, including IHOP, where people are praying night and day uh, for Israel and Jerusalem. And praise God, a lot of great prayers going up. Also with that, a lot of sort of mystical stuff about Jerusalem that is, it's there in the Bible. It's pretty mystical. It's pretty amazing. This is the place that God has chosen to dwell. Wow. <clears throat> but we just need to remind ourselves this righteousness, right? That's what he says. Tzidka, her righteousness, the righteousness of Yerushalayim, of Zion, is only going to come one way, okay? And that's not from our government. It's not from a right-wing government. It's not from a left-wing government. It's from the wings of El Shaddai, as Asher just blessed you, under the wings, under his wings, okay? Not right wing, not left wing, not from the, the, uh, the uh, Beit Mishpat, from the uh, ministry, what is it called? The Supreme Court and the court system. It's going to come from God, who is our righteousness. Turn with me to Jeremiah. Okay, I want to read to you two prophecies that connect this theme of righteousness, his righteousness, to the Messiah, okay? This is Jeremiah, first, Jeremiah 23, uh, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to read in Hebrew <coughs> and then uh, translate. Hine yamim ba'im ne'um Adonai v'hakimoti le'david tzemach tzadik u'malach melech v'hiskil v'asa mishpat u'tzdaka ba'aretz. Twice the word tzedek, righteousness, comes. In those days, the Lord speaking, Jeremiah speaking about the last days, I will raise up to David a branch, a righteous branch, and he will, a, a king will rule and be vehiskil and be very, very smart. <laughs> That's the bad translation. You get a better translation in your English Bibles. Vasa <laughs> mishpan, and he will, uh, ju he will judge for righteousness, and righteousness will be established in the land. And then in verse 6, Be'amav tivasha Yehuda v'Yisrael yishkon levetach, v'ze shmo asher yikro Adonai tzidkenu. I want you to all just say that. Adonai tzidkenu. Tzidkenu. And that means the Lord, Adonai, Yehovah, 
our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, Jerusalem's righteousness. Who is the Lord? Who is Jehovah? Yeshua. Don't make any, I know people have banners, Yehovah, wow, wow, wow. But there's the name. The name of Yeshua is now the name which is above every other name. Amen. It's at His name. Not the name Jehovah. Not the name El Shaddai. At His name, Yeshua, the man, the Son of Man, the Son of God, that every tongue, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that He is Kurios. That's the New Testament word for Jehovah. Yeah, He is Jehovah. Okay? Jeremiah 33, 10 chapters later, verses 15 and 16. Almost the same prophecy, but with a little twist. The same thing, verse 15. In those days, a branch of David, a righteous branch of David, he will make judgment <coughs> and righteousness in the land. And then, pay attention to verse 16 and a slight twist. Biamim haem. In those days, Tivasha Yehuda, that's what he said before. In verse in chapter 23, it said Yehuda, Judah, and Israel. Here it says Judah and Viusha and Jerusalem. Tishkon Levetach, they will dwell in peace, safety. Vze Asher Yikra La, and this is what he will call her. It, in chapter 23, this is what he, he will be called. The Lord, our righteousness, talking about the Messiah. Here it's what she will be called. In Hebrew, you know, we have mas everything's masculine and feminine, like in some, some languages. Thank God in Chinese they don't have it. It makes it easy, right? Uh, but the city, cities are feminine, okay? And so Jerusalem is a feminine noun. So this is talking about Jerusalem, the name that she will be called. Adonai, say it again, say it with me, Adonai Tzidkenu, the same name. Wow. He's going to call the Lord our righteousness is the name of the Messiah, and it's the name of his city. That's a little mystical. But that's how closely the Messiah is identified with this city. The same name, the Lord our righteousness Right? The branch of David, the Messiah, the son of David, Jerusalem, the Lord, our righteousness. Equals, equals, equals. It's the same thing. You see that? The Messiah, son of David, Jerusalem, his city, and it's him. Adonai Tzidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Okay? Some of my favorite verses uh, in, in the New Covenant are in Romans chapter 3. All right, you can flip there if you want. Romans 3, I'd like to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read verse 26. Okay, in Romans, Paul is speaking about the Lord's righteousness, the justice, the justification of the Lord. The same theme from Jeremiah. And he says in verse 26, for, the, for this demonstration, he's been talking about how God has demonstrated his righteousness. This demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua. In English, they had to play between the words righteousness and justice to make it work in English. In the Greek, it's the same word. And in Hebrew, it's the same word. Dia, dia kusone, I think, is, is the Greek. Righteousness, just, he, if he is just, it means he's the one who is righteous. And the justifier is the one who makes us righteous. Okay, but that kind of got long, and so they like just in English to say the justifier. That's God. That's the Messiah. He is the Lord, our righteousness. He is Hatzadik, the great righteous one. And the one who makes you and me righteous. How? Those who have faith in Yeshua. Or have the faith of Yeshua. It can, be in, it can be translated either way. So let's just remind ourselves over and over again. As you pray this week. And continue to pray next week and next month. When you're praying for Israel. Remember the heart of the apostle Romans 10. He says brethren my heart's desire. What I'm all trying to explain to you. About what God is doing in Israel is this. 
is that they be saved, okay? Make no mistakes about it. This city is, nothing's going to happen without the revelation of Yeshua to Jews and Arabs in this city, secular, religious, imams and rabbis and all that. That's where our righteousness and our salvation and the burning salvation that Isaiah 62 is burning like a lamp is going to come from that. So pray for the gospel. We're gospel-centered, right? Pray for us who are sharing the gospel here in this city, in Hebrew and Arabic, okay? Pray for the people. Pray for their salvation. Amen? And I say that too because, listen, I was, I was just in America and visiting different places, and there's sometimes a lot of, you know, I can always tell when I go to a group and uh, we get into the question and answer time, I can always tell where their heart and prayer and theology is coming from when it comes to, you know how I can tell? Tell you, right? Question and answer time right? First five questions. So is BB and this right-wing government, do you think, what is this civil war? What's going on? Is it left, right? Wow, da, da, okay? Or uh, the Iranians and Hezbollah and on the border, is this going to happen? What do you think about that? Da, 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 da. Okay? When I get a lot of questions like that, I know, I, I know the people's where they're coming from, and that their primary prayer for Israel is not what we just shared. There are even some Christians who kind of think, some express it uh, vocally, some make a deal, some are quiet, but they kind of think that actually, somehow Israel and the Jewish people are going to get saved and good things are going to happen without Jesus. Yeah, shh. Yeah, because if you talk about Jesus too much with the Jewish people, da, 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 then they don't, you don't get to take your picture with the politicians and the rabbis, and you don't get done, you don't get the big blessing, and you don't get your name on the trees, and blah, 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 blah. Okay? Uh, I know when I hear from a group, when they start out, the first question, so what's happening with the gospel? Tell us what's going on in the body in, 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 in Israel, with Jew and Arab. Are you seeing people come to the Lord? Da, da, da. That's a different, people are coming from a different place. All right. Now, I said at the beginning, both things are important. All right. It's just got to get what's the head and what's the tail. Okay. Got to keep your priorities straight because this is point number two from Isaiah 62. Let's go to verses uh, six through nine of Isaiah 62. This is the second point. Okay. Which justifies the sort of Christian Zionist focus on the peace and prosperity of of, of Jerusalem. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I've appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind Jehovah, take no rest for yourselves. Give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord is sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm. I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it will eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it will drink it in the court's of my sanctuary. So, let's translate this into modern English. You need to pray for the Jewish people to have good food, okay? And for Israel people to work hard and to make a living and to enjoy the fruits of their living, okay? You didn't think about it that way, but that's what he's saying, all right? In other words, peace and prosperity, okay? Because guess what? Dead people can't praise the Lord and dead people can't get saved, Okay, And if our enemies succeed in wiping out the Jewish state, as they're constantly talking about, and killing lots of Jews, those Jews are not going to connect to number one, our number one prayer, Okay, because they're dead. So you need to pray for the peace and prosperity of Israel and Jerusalem, peace between Jew and Arab, that this country will be stable, that our economy will prosper, all those good things, and that we have some good food, which we do. I'll have a lot of it, maybe too much. All right. Um, you know, when I think about this, uh, also from the New Testament, I think about 1 Timothy chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul directs, give us some, maybe the most specific instructions in all of the New Testament about how we're supposed to pray. And how are we supposed to pray? 1 Timothy 2, from verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties, entreaties, entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil, tranquil and quiet life in all godliness 
and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one, media, one mediator, <clears throat> the man, Messiah, Yeshua. Okay? You know, we, we hear, if you look at church history, way back and in present day, we know that huge, when you see a big revivals, very often it's under persecution and very, very difficult times. That's when people, a lot of people turn to the Lord. But here, that may happen, and that may be the way that lots of Jews and Arabs eventually come to the Lord. But what's expressed here, it's very clear. We are to pray for our government. And you need to pray for the government of Israel, because we got a big balagan, as we say in Hebrew. Everyone say that with me, balagan. It's a very important word around here, balagan. It means a big mess, okay? We've had... We had five elections in two years, three years, about, something like that. We can even lose count, okay? And then finally we get this big coalition, and it's, well, a big, we got a lot of big issues in our country, and the government has kind of gotten to a, I'll say, a, somewhat of a dysfunctional place, okay? You need to pray for that. We need good government. We need peace and prosperity in this land because it's God's will for all men to be saved. Somehow... If, you know, there things that harassment, persecution, that's in God's hands. We're not asking for that, okay? We're asking for peace and prosperity to live a tranquil, tranquil and godly life and to give the demonstration of the gospel to our people. Amen? So again, number one, pray for the salvation, the righteousness, Adonai Tzidkenu, the Lord, Messiah, Jerusalem. We're praying for the revelation of the Son of God, in Jerusalem. Number two, dead people can't praise the Lord, can't accept Him, can't see Yeshua. We need peace and prosperity and unity, right? Because it's God's desire that all men be saved. Amen? Now the third one, I'm going to play a little trick on you here. The third one, third point in prayer uh, in Isaiah 62 is actually not in Isaiah 62. All right? That's the trick, okay? And it's not in Isaiah 62 because it's not anywhere in the Tanakh or in the Old Testament. But it's very, very, very important. It's the one new man. It's what Asher was just blessing you with, with the Ruth blessing. The revelation of Jew and Gentile of this body of this reconciliation and unity that we have. I love what Asher is in his sharing with this uh, friend, this Jewish man. I mean, I don't know if you caught this, but Asher asked him the question, well, if, he's, if there's one God, then he has to be the God of everybody. And that Jewish man said, oh! Now, you should be going, oh! I can't believe he's going, oh! Doesn't he understand that? <gasps> well, that made me... <coughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, read Genesis. There's one God, right? Did he make all men, male and female, in his image? Yeah? Well, you know what Orthodox Jews read there? They don't say this, but this is what they believe. That he made all Jews in his image. Okay? Because we're the chosen people. And we're up here. And the Jewish soul is higher and more holy than, 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 than the Gentiles. And they don't, see, they don't understand or think really that the Gentiles have any kind of possible relationship with God except by observing some of the Noah, Noahide commandments and being good people, and maybe they'll get a place in the world to come, but we're not really sure, and who cares? I've just summed up lots of Orthodox Jewish theology, okay? That's really what they think and how they live, all right? Without revelation, that's because they're living according to the Torah and according to the Mishnah and the Talmud and all this stuff. This mystery of the Gentiles and the church, the ecclesia, it's not in the prophets. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. This is one of my favorite subjects to teach on. I wrote a book called One New Man on Ephesians 2 and 3. Okay, where Paul is explaining this mystery of what God is doing, that the Gentiles are co-heirs together with the Jewish remnant. We are one. You're children of God just as much as we are, right? And he says in, in Ephesians 3, verses 4 and 6, 
By referring to this, this mystery that he's been explaining, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Messiah, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. What's the revelation? What's the mystery? To be specific, here it is, that the Gentiles, the nations, are fellow heirs fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Messiah Yeshua through the gospel. Partners equal with the Jews in Messiah. Okay? And he says that revelation was not made known to Isaiah, to the previous generation. They couldn't see it. They could see Jerusalem. They could see her righteousness. In Isaiah especially, you see there's a positive role for some of the nations carrying the Jews on their back and, and doing wonderful things for the Jews. But you don't see them as full partners of the kingdom. Sons and daughters, just like the Jews. Part of the commonwealth of Israel. It was in the scriptures he just said, I knew Asher was thinking that, but I'm glad he said it. Paul said it wasn't made known to them. Okay, they, they wrote it, but they couldn't see it. Agreed? All right. They couldn't see it. It's there, but they couldn't see it. But now it's being, it was being revealed 2,000 years ago and is still being revealed through the apostles and prophets, through the New Testament, through you all being here and us being together, that we are co-heirs and co-body, part of the same body. So you need to pray, and this might be a, a strange sort of click for you, but if you're praying for Israel, you need to also pray for the unity of the body of Christ. Okay? Because we are Israel. That's part of the revelation. That's also part of the meaning of Israel. Romans 9, 6. Not all of Israel is Israel. He's talking about the Jewish remnant. End of Romans 9, he says, not just from among the Jews whom he's called, but also from the Gentiles, quoting Hosea. Those, those who are not my people are now my people. Okay? You guys, when you're praying for Israel, you're praying for Jerusalem and Israel and the Jews and the number one and number two, but you're also praying for yourselves and for the body and the unity of the body. We know Yeshua's prayer in John 17, his, law, his most important prayer in the New Testament. John 17, 20, 21. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that... Know this by heart. So that the world may believe that you sent me. Okay? Translated, a key to world evangelism and to the world, including Jews and Arabs in this city and Israel, seeing Yeshua and believing in him is the unity of the body. Right? That's what he prayed. That's what he meant. God hears his prayers. It's happening. It's going to happen. And it's a key. And this is what word is happening in these weeks. It's what's going to happen this weekend. We've got groups and representatives from all kinds of groups, missions groups, prayer groups, prophetic groups who are gathering in Jerusalem this weekend for 24 hours of prayer starting Saturday night through Sunday. There's going to be a big event somewhere close to here. I don't want to say it on, tele on, the, on the video, but we're going to have people de declaring Jew and Gentile together, different streams of the body together. Praying for Israel, praying for Jerusalem, and praying for the gospel to go out to every tribe, tongue, and nation. Okay? So, we're praying for the salvation, the righteousness, Adonai Tzidkenu, to be revealed to the people of Israel and Jerusalem. We're praying for their peace and prosperity. Okay? Because dead people can't get saved. Right? And number three, we're praying for the one new man, the unity of the body of Messiah. I was teaching on this a few days ago in, in, uh, at Kingdom Living, actually, on Shabbat. And uh, I was teaching from Ephesians 4, where Paul says that this outpouring from the ascension of Yeshua in the five-fold ministry is for the building up and the equipping of the body of Messiah until it comes to a place of unity and maturity. All of us, he added the word all of us, not just a remnant, to a place of unity and maturity that is of the same stature of the pleroma, the fullness of God in Yeshua. Translated, as much as he is God, 
he desires and plans for us to be one. How much is he God? 90%, 99%, pleroma, the fullness. Colossians 2.9, in him, all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. It's him. Okay, that's easy, maybe hard to believe, easy to believe. But Ephesians 4, saying that we're all going to come to unity and maturity to that same level, that same stature. Wow, we've got to believe that. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I believe it because it's in the Word of God. Let's move to the fourth one and the last point from Isaiah 62. Uh, Read verses 4 and 5, which are probably the most mystical Verses in Isaiah 62. It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said, desolate. But you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. God has chosen this earth. God has chosen this land. God has chosen this city. And he says, I'm going to marry this city. God is coming here to have a marriage ceremony and to make his home here with us. Revelation 21, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Okay? I'll read from Revelation 21, verses 1 1 through 4, and we'll close with this, okay? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. We're not going up there, it's coming down here made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Here's the bridal language again. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, mourning, crying, pain, for the first things have passed away. We are praying for Israel and Jerusalem. Hallelujah. We're praying for the salvation of Jews and Arabs, for the Lord, his righteousness, to make his righteousness known among us. We're praying for the peace and prosperity so that those people can be alive and well and believing. We're praying for the unity of the body, which is part of God's Israel, okay? Because through that, he's promised, according to Yeshua's prayer and according to Ephesians 4, to reveal himself to the, to, to the world, And four, when we're praying for Israel and Jerusalem, we're praying, we're saying, well, ultimately, what this is all about and where this is going is the God of the universe, the creator, who has his home, his center, somewhere out there in the middle of the universe. And Yeshua is sitting at his right hand. And he's saying, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm moving house. I'm moving my dwelling, my tabernacle. I made this earth out of all the galaxies, of all that. I made this place to be my dwelling. And it's so close to me, and I'm looking so much, I'm looking forward to joining with it and living there that it's like a marriage. It's like a man marrying a woman. And we're going to live together. Not out there, here. So keep that in mind when you're praying for Israel and Jerusalem from Isaiah 62. That's the big picture. That's the big story. But we're not going to jump to that. There's a process. One, two, three, four. Got it? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the words, your holy words, Lord, that give us life. Thank you, God, that you direct our prayers. The apostle prayed in Romans 8. We don't know how we should pray properly, but the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Lord, help us to pray through this end of this week and to continue, Lord, praying for these things as you lead because you are making intercession for us for these things to happen 24 hours a day all the time. 
Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, Lord. We, we agree with your 24-hour intercession for this planet. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.